Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. Uh, it's going to be a quick one because uh, we're getting all sorts of technical problems here. So we'll start with our biggest technical problem, which is John Tashek. Welcome, John. I'm glad to be your biggest technical problem, Steve. Welcome back. Welcome from back Florida. from Florida. <laughs> all right, if we do in one more take, I think we can get it perfectly in sync. No, we're not going to do another take. Uh, joining us from Half Moon Bay, Robert Scoble. Hey, how are you doing? It's a weird Friday, I don't know. Uh, also joining us from Half Moon Bay, no, he's not I there yet, is Kevin Morris. Exactly. <laughs> and is he, uh, is he coming? He wrote me on Twitter, but I only got the message like nine minutes ago that he wanted to come over here and re and uh, use my Wi-Fi. Probably downstairs knocking. Nah, Miriam's downstairs. She'll let him in. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, Keith Tier, where are you? I am uh, home in Palo Alto. This is my home office. Excellent. And I just want to say how much I admire Robert's new haircut. You are? Yeah. Great haircut, Robert. I don't think he can hear you. No, he can't. All right, one more time. Robert, great haircut. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Top quality entertainment. You just can't get this anywhere else. Believe me. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one's trying, but. <laughs> All right. Uh, Scoble, what's going on? I don't know. A lot of people pitched their books this week. Um <sighs> I, I just have been so freaking busy that I haven't really paid too much attention to the news. Um, right now, on top of tech meme, is Google is uh, trying to push through some new terms of service updates, which uh, uh, give them the rights to do ads, sort of like Facebook has uh, with your names, you know, with your friends' names on them. Um, iPhone 5s are crashing more than iPhone than older models and I, I'm having that problem but it's not bothersome yet because I use Android for six months so I'm used to a little bit of a pain when I'm using my uh, my phones but I have noticed more crashes uh, <clears throat> on my iPhone side of the fence um, I don't know what else has been happening all right this iPhone thing is two percent as opposed to one percent. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like I said, it's not bothersome yet, but I have noticed that I'm getting crashes where I, on my old phone, I know I didn't get that. I think it's an iOS seven thing. I, I, and uh, I'm sure an update will come out in a little while and fix a lot of them. But it's not. It's iOS probably 7. the rampant update of iOS seven apps that just have been rushed to the market to. Yeah, that's part of it, but they they were iOS 7 on my old phone was crashing with apps all over the place. In fact, Patrick, when he got when he first got iOS 7, could crash an app just by touching it and repeatedly doing doing that. And that's sort of why I called it a disaster. Um, uh, you know, when it first was coming out for developers, and they clearly haven't had much time to beta test this thing, so they got rid of most of the bugs. But there's still a few bugs there, and uh, they'll clean those up. I'm not too worried. This is one of those things I, you know, that they should have uh, taken a little bit more time and leaked it out a little more. I think. Uh, yeah. It's, it's developers have to switch over some mentality, and on the 5s, you have to do 64-bit too. Yeah, it, uh, it's uh, you it's know it's running fine. more stuff in the background. They changed the architecture a bit, and it takes some time to clean it up. You know, uh, yeah. people don't understand how software engineering works, and it takes time. It'll get cleaned up. I'm not. I'm not too worried about it. My my phone is working just fine, most of the time. Keith, your <laughs> comments. What's that? Keith, your comments. Uh, well, uh, there are a few bugs in iOS seven. I've seen them, but overall, it's fine. The most buggy software I'm running right now is Skype six point nine on a Mac, uh, and which is what we're using for the show on my side at least, and. I guarantee an hour from now, uh, I won't be able to move. Uh, I, or I'll be able to move, but you won't be able to see me moving because uh, it just starts sucking up memory and CPU. It gets to 200% CPU on my system. 
and I've got a big system. So uh, Skype, Skype screwed up big time with the latest release. Uh, Kevin Marks, welcome. <laughs> He's outside of Robert's house. <laughs> yeah, I can hear the I can hear the air, but not where. Here. Where are you, Kevin? I'm at the Half Moon Bay Coffee Roasting Co. Oh, you're you're like uh, ten minutes away from me. Yep, just around the corner. Excellent. Well, so, the sun is out. You came over here on a good day, and uh, by the way, if you come over to my house, there's some cool people coming at three or four. Oh, well, I may drop by later on. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. You, you, just imagine you can hang out with cool people. Cool people. <laughs> you're cool clearly people. not one of them. <laughs> cool. Very cool people. <laughs> <laughs> cool well, than I, was, I am, certainly. I can't, I can't tell you what my Friday afternoons are like here because it's just <laughs> it's too crazy. But it, it's been quite epic lately. <laughs> so, Robert, you wrote something about uh, how wonderful Google Plus uh, or Hangouts or whatever it is that they are now calling it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so what is it that's so great about it? Uh, well, the quality took a dramatic uh, pump up. Uh, uh, it, this week when I did it, it asked me, would you like to turn on HD? And I, of course I go, yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden the picture's like, whoa, <laughs> dramatically better. <laughs> and um, better than what we're getting on Gilmore Gang even. And, is um, this m the move to VP8? Or is this, I don't know uh, what they did, uh, but it it's like four times sharper. Easy. It's like, wow, I get the full HD of my camera now on on the on the hangout and the capturing is good they also added a, a few new chat features like i can a ask my audience or my i can a ask my audience to uh send in questions and they come in one at a time and i can say i'm answering that question and um it builds it into the video and they uh, the layout is getting better it's uh easier to use for somebody like what do you Tina mean it builds to, it into the video well, when you answer the video, the question, it can take you right to the answer of that question. You know, YouTube has the ability to, uh, when you play it back, uh, take you right to the time code of the of the. Uh, oh, they uh, sync uh, the question with the video. Uh, where you're, yeah, with your oh, that's clever. So they're putting it oh, in the time, awesome. a timeline tracking. That's that's smart. Yeah. Yeah, it's not cool. Very good. It's very nice. <laughs> that's and something they used to pay things. millions of dollars to Virage for. Yeah, there's a few other things. There's a nice chat room there. There's also uh, uh, nice lower thirds now, so you can turn on and off lower thirds and put stuff on them. Uh, lower thirds are the, the graphics at the bottom of, you know, like CNN that shows you uh, the guy's name who's talking. And, um, yeah, and it's free, you know, which is really nice. So you don't have to have a $20,000 TriCaster, which I love too, but that's... a Another thing. So, well, you it sounds like tri, you still need a TriCaster if you're going to do multiple, multiple uh, guests. Well, no, you can have nine eight so. guests in one room. Yeah, no, you can't do what we're doing right now, which is a two shot. Uh, you can't okay. do the two shot. No, but but somebody said there's a way to do that with software, and you just have to play around. I I'm not that geeky, and I'm not going to be that geeky. So I just uh, want you, to you can take tools. over the entire feed uh, yeah, and you, do you, it through you can software choose, you but can choose you can't do both too, but yeah right but you but that you know that's something that they could add in, in future once you've yeah soft you know once you put this through a software chain you can do that kind of thing it's just a question of it to get them getting around to adding that yeah yeah and by the way it was live on youtube immediately after i finished the uh, hangout which is also different it used to take a few minutes for it to process but it was it Within 10 seconds of me quitting the uh, show and then going and refreshing the page and then watching the, re the recorded, it was up and live. It was like, whoa, that it was fast. So well, That's interesting. So they must, be, they yeah. must be processing it as they go along then. That, that would make sense. Yeah. They just so, feed it into the, into the processing chain as you make it. So just Dave, Dave Weiner is going to love that feature. Who is? Hmm? Dave Weiner. Yeah. No. No, he's nope. not going to love that feature. <laughs> <laughs> In other words... Basically, you've been borged into the YouTube, uh, Google, uh, you know, universe, and uh, yeah, you're locked it, in there. It works just fine until uh, everybody else goes out of business, like they've done with. Well, readers. it works fine until you get a copyright claim, and then your videos disappear, and you don't have any way of getting them back. That's that's the tricky part. If you accidentally show um, something that has music in it, then your entire um, video gets blocked. 
But just just in case somebody from uh, New Tech is listening, um, Steve is being opened up here to an alternative route, which involves yeah. negotiation. Uh, Wirecast with uh, black magic like I have to bend over. cameras. <laughs> and so you better give him that high def thing soon. Well, what I want to know is if, if that feed is automatically in the video and points to it, and somebody asks you a question about a product and you like it, does that mean that that content is Google's and will show up on any potential ad they bring to somebody else as a recommendation? Absolutely. I would suppose so. Uh, well, so your uh, random comments that are that you feel aren't super public can be took uh, maybe taken out of context. But this is uh, you know uh, uh, John's referring to the uh, update to Google's terms and conditions, which mirrors Facebook's, um, and you know this is this is an interesting moment because it really shows you that uh, we, the audience, are actually becoming. Um, only targets. Uh, as business models become uh, pressured um, uh, to generate money, especially on mobile, we, we, we are not no longer like the recipients of services, but we now the targets, and we've now moved from being the targets to being the uh, advocates for various brands that we probably unintentionally become advocates for. And it, you know, you just wonder whether somebody there isn't saying internally, "Is this crossing a line where we're going to start losing users because we're abusing the, their trust?" Right. Well, that's that's the challenge with it because that's that's been the issue with Facebook doing it in that they've taken. Um, any like you've ever made and use that as an endorsement to show to others. And this was a big problem early on with the Facebook platform where third parties were doing this and saying, you know, basically grabbing random pictures of your friends and saying, your friend here has endorsed this thing um, completely falsely. And now, but now Facebook has, has been doing it and trying to be a bit more legit about it, except that um, they also at some point added the every time you send a link to something, that's an implicit like of it um, to Facebook, which, which caused problems too. So there's a you know, there's a there's a series of, of, of tricky issues to get over there. Um, I don't think there's a big problem with something that I've deliberately endorsed showing up. I, uh, you know, if I've actually said I like this thing, then that's good. But if it, if it's just I mention this thing in passing and then I'm then uh, mentions counts an endorsement, that is that is much trickier. Yeah, and I'm not sure they're copying Facebook directly. There's definitely some copying, but uh -huh. the, the 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 plus one has always been featured in ads. Or promotions yeah. in the in your feeds, and they've been gathering reviews on on Google um, for ages, on the on the Google Maps and on the Google Local. They've been getting getting you to review things and posting those, and that's that's been part of the you know, part of the model there for a long time. Yeah, they're just making it more clear and giving you a, f a, a capability of opting out too. I'm not yeah. defending this in any way. I think this is uh, I think this is just going down a the theme of the people are the content, and well, and. I I think you know the, 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 the idea the of um, endorsed by someone I know is actually very valuable. That's, that's to one of the reasons to Google content as so an ad. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I just I'd like uh, a choice between two megaliths rather than just one. Well, the other challenge is is um, Come in. how how corrupt reviews are on the net as well. There was a great post by Sue Charman at um, uh, Forbes this week on how we need an X prize for online reviews to actually come up with some way of making them non-corrupt. And there yeah. was a, and there's a, like the New York um, attorney's office was investigating corruption in reviews as, as well for um, restaurant reviews and things like that. So there, there's, a, there's a big issue with these being dubious in the first place. So this, this, this saying, okay, we'll take your user things and feed them into that is potentially a way of making that better. But the problem is if the intent's not there or if the intent is nefarious, if suddenly there's a hundred there's people who create accounts and like this coffee shop and that, and, um, and because it, it, you know, the, the owner asked them to, then that, that gets problematic. Yeah, well, that's going to happen. So, you know. so review my book, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have, yeah. Speaking it's, it's of corruption, we, we already have first? 133 reviews and uh, 116 are five star reviews. I don't think it, you need any more promotion there, Robert. I do. We always need more promotion. I mean, I, but there's <laughs> no way of measuring it, Robert. Oh, you, there you've is. already broken all the uh, metrics meters. 
<laughs> you go you go to Amazon, you can, it's it's like a, a penis measuring contest. You know, how many reviews Whoa. do you have and how many of them are five star? Now this I'm new away. for the Gilmore gang. <laughs> What's that? I think this is new for the human race. I've never actually seen a penis measuring contest. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an old zap comics that I can um, I'm sure if you Google still it, you'll find one. <laughs> <laughs> Endorsed by Scoble. <laughs> right. There yeah. you go. Let's see how that <laughs> metric flies around the universe. Not to disclose anything, but that is not a competition I would join. <laughs> no, that's just British understatement for you. <laughs> okay. I can't. Anyway, there's nowhere to go from my this. book, please. <laughs> it's all up from here. That's the only good thing about it. You know, uh, there is one interesting thing that happened this week, Steve, which we can talk about, one. Okay. which is uh, oh. Apple acquired uh, Q, C-U-E. That was last week. Yeah. It was last week, but it got talked about. Scoble mentioned it at the end of last week's show, so that's very good. It's kind of like yeah, a checkerboard. Yeah, it only effect. just happened last Friday, so we didn't really get a chance to talk about it. And now there's been a lot of speculation that this is Apple's play for competing with Google now. And given the age of context, uh, it'd be interesting what Robert's take is on that. Yeah, it's well, Q is uh, sort of a competitor of Google now and, and a whole bunch of others. I mean, there's 15 different versions. They did, a, they had a nice, uh, a nice team. You know, uh, they got what, about 30 something million for that. So that's sort of a little bit high for an Aqua hire, but not really high. <laughs> Uh, you know, my friend Andy uh, Grignan got offered twenty million by Twitter without even having a product, just to get to him and another developer. So, um, you know, in the valley, superstars are going for that in that range. Um, and Apple, it's clear now to me after enough work on this stuff that Google is building a contextual operating system that's coming soon. Uh, soon being in, in the next two years. Um, and Apple is clearly heading that way too. If you look inside the privacy settings, it's watching where you're located and they're building sensors in and they just hired the guy who, who ran the Nike fuel band team. And it's, it's very clear that Apple is seeing the same patterns that, that um, you know, Google was. And so they need talent to shore up their uh, talent pool there and get them into the contextual world. Um, and Q certainly understands this this world very well. You know whether they were the best at it doesn't really matter as long as you're on the dartboard. Um, you know you can use that team and then uh, guide them a little bit and say, okay, here's what we need, and you know how to build it. So go, you know. The thing I uh, there was some article somewhere uh, in the past few days about uh, Google Now and you know what you're talking about, uh, both of you. Uh, yeah. And to me, the the fundamental limitation of the strategy, and I think that everybody shares this problem, is the inability to see it as being a uh, an Uber operating system. They they're all. I mean, Google Now is. Uh, they're very coy about how they're yeah. going to move in the future in terms of opening up. The smartest thing they could do would be to open it up to iOS immediately because it would get such traction that it would be very difficult for anybody else to catch up to them. For yeah, they've got it on iOS, but you have, to, you have to go through the Google app. The problem is they can't hook in at the notification layer on iOS as easily. If you install the Google um, search app on iOS and click it, then you get Google Now. Um, prompts. Um, yeah, uh, but but you know the po the point I'm trying to make is is that there are always these kinds of issues. But Google historically has always uh, had this problem of uh, you know trying to sell something of their own, and therefore uh, mostly in the apps layer, they they tend to favor those apps over iOS apps, and it makes sense from an economic perspective to a point. But right now well, it doesn't make sense at all. They they should make it. They should make the the access to their apps. I mean, Chrome, uh, I, uh, Chrome on iOS is now uh, three percent up from like one percent only a few months ago. So right. you know when they do do that's shocking, by the way. But go ahead. Why is that? I can't believe anyone, not everyone, would use Chrome. 
You, uh, you know, okay. Well, it doesn't support I just got reading my, lists, for example. That's I just why got I my brother-in-law on the iPhone for the first time. He is struggling just to get used to this n new world that just got opened up to him. He's not going to switch to Chrome. He's going to stick with what's on his phone. He'll yeah, find he Chrome sucks. in two years. You only switch to Chrome if you understand the, the value of the thing switching across machines, and that's something that appeals to us. But if you don't but have lots of machines, everybody's on more than one machine. Yeah, but I mean, uh, how many people sure, watch the more gang? Wait, How many people one at a watch time. No More Gang or read TechCrunch? Very, very few people. Yeah, but it's not even that. There's, it, you can't do uh, on Chrome what you can do on iOS, and you can't do what you can do on iOS. No, on no, Chrome. I'm running Chrome on no, no, iOS. That's not true. What? If you what run can't Chrome you on do? iOS, I don't, it, it synchronizes properly the way it does with Chrome OS and with. with I use uh, reading list. I use reading list constantly in order to try and uh, prepare for the show or just prepare for getting out of bed. And uh, well, it's well, not Chrome, supported you get the on. Between devices, you, you get the same thing effectively. Yeah, I except that it doesn't work in the other place. And if yeah, either of them got hip about it and opened the reading list up or opened uh, the Chrome environment up uh, to apps on, on it this. totally works. You just log, you sign into Chrome. It works. You on have every to device. go. You have to go through it, it works Apple's Chrome, blockade. You know, you've yeah, got a Safari is like a little, you know, toy. What? You know, Safari is pretty decent these days. It's yeah, fast. It's just a. It doesn't do anything besides what a browser should do. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that thing does that and a little more. Because these things a browser shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, I'll give you one thing that uh, that Safari does that Chrome does not do is the little read. Uh, what do they call it? Up at the top of the screen, it's in a different location now. Uh, reader. It, it basically allows you to strip out all the ads and just read the thing. Uh, particularly on a on the iPhone, uh, it's the only way that I can even see anything. Uh, given that the, these web pages now uh, somehow are not aware of the fact that uh, of the uh, iPhone device or. A mobile device, and so they persist on keeping the font size illegible, and uh, really to confuse things, some some of them will refuse to allow you to resize it so that you can drill in on it. So I know, think, I, 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 yeah, I think if you use a Mac and you're using iOS, I don't know why you wouldn't just use Safari, Steve. I agree with you. I think you would only use Chrome if you're using Android and or a PC along with something from Apple. Well, but I think that there sense. there are real, really good reasons, you know, on uh, on the MacBook Air, which I'm increasingly using again. Uh, Chrome is far superior to uh, mm. to Safari. Yeah, and uh, it also brings in all of these other uh, you know environments that you should be able to have access to. All so I'm saying Chrome is Chrome has the, like, the notification ahead. support that actually means that the notifications come through as well, which is quite nice, and that isn't fully there in Safari yet. So there's, there's, yeah. there's web notifications that pop up from the top of the window, and Chrome supports those, so when you get a, a message from Gmail or something, even if you don't have Gmail open, it still appears. Okay, that, that's very handy. I'm, I'm going to sort of ride you, Kevin, because it's uh, uh, very noisy is around it, you. Is there traffic noise? Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Um, just if you, if you are talking and don't hear anything, you'll know why. Okay. Uh, also, speaking of notifications, Twitter has come out with an interesting uh, direct message uh, notification uh, scenario. Have you been following that, any of you? Yeah, the news feature, the, 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 what do they call it, something carrot or something, or parrot, news parrot or something. Yeah, news parrot. What's that? It, it, you know, it seems to be an attempt for them to do news tracking. But I couldn't get my head around it. When I looked at it, it wasn't obvious to me how it would work. Yeah, I only got one so far. I turned it on, and this is the one I got. Event it's like parrot. a little uh, news thing that it sent me. It's pretty useless so far. Yeah, but it's a start. I mean, you know, right now when something like what that uh, text is saying about Boehner doing or saying something uh, appears, it usually appears uh, on my notifications first on the New York Times alerts and then on the Wall Street Journal alerts and then finally on the marketplace alerts. Yeah. So, you know, if you start to see if this is personalized, I mean, they already have 25,000 followers. 
So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether they can scale up to this and provide any kind of interesting personalization. But right now, I doubt it. What's the handle for it? What's the Twitter handle for it? Event Parrot. Event as in something happens. Event yep. Parrot. Parrot, as parrot in like the bird. Bird. It's funny. There's already name squatting. Somebody's got news parrot, news underscore parrot. Yeah. And uh, by the way, uh, Jeremy, uh, who said this? J Jerry Schumann uh, corrected me about the Nike guy. He actually ran the... Uh, what did he run? <laughs> run the lab over at Nike, not 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 the Nike fuel band. He said. Anyways, I don't understand what you're saying. I just got his former uh, title wrong. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, notifications seem to be heating up. What's that? This is my new uh, low energy Bluetooth radio from Estimote. And Estimote. what does that do? This is a new uh, startup came out of Y Combinator, and uh, it uh, spits a, an identifier into the ear. So low energy Bluetooth is not the same as Bluetooth uh, in your car uh, or on your, you know, stereo system. Uh, this is a identifying beacon, basically. It's spitting a number into the air, and I got three of them. So and they're different colors. So when I get my iPhone close to one of these things, it senses that and, and can do things with it. What kind of things? Yeah, what does it uh, do? Well, uh, the, the baseball association is putting these into the baseball parks. So as I walk around with the new uh, baseball app that will be out next year, uh, it'll do things. Uh, if I get close to uh, – a famous spot, for instance, it could say, hey, Babe Ruth stood here, you know. And if I uh, get close to a bar, it could tell me uh, the best whiskey for me. Uh, if I get close to other people uh, who have the same app going, it could uh, let us share details with each other. New kind of dating, maybe. Um, and uh, we're going to... Uh, Robin, it's going to place those things in museums where you walk around and you see an exhibit and, and you just have your phone and it gives you more context and information. Yeah, right. we're going to put we're going to put these into the Half Moon Bay Ritz. So uh, if you come to the Ritz uh, and turn on the Estimote app, you you might be able to see them, and we're going to play around a little bit with them. So, but they don't pass data, right? They're just broadcasting the number, and then the cloud and the app know which data is associated with that number. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you have so to run an app. It's really just like a, a GPS marker without the need to use GPS. Right. Right. Uh, now you can you can build payment systems because as I get closer to this, it could say, "Oh, you're ready to pay, and we'll take your money." Um, sort of like NFC, right? But I don't have to tap it. Uh, this 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 can be sensed from about thirty meters away if it's a straight line of sight. Um, uh, to the, one of these beacons, uh, and it can tell that you're getting closer to it. So as I get closer to like this green beacon, it my app could be changing all the while and could be displaying new information. So, um, so basically, it solves the last thirty feet problem because the yep. normal GPS accuracy is about thirty feet. This brings yep. it down to probably one foot. Yep, uh, two inches. It can tell two inches, inches, okay. Away. Brings it down to two inches, so you can be very precise. Now you can serve data in a two-inch yeah. space. It could work really well for penis competitions, actually, think about it. Kill me yeah. now. Um, the other thing is he's put a sensor, a couple sensors in here, which he hasn't explained what uh, the company has, uh, and they haven't told us what those sensors are. I know there's a, at least a temperature sensor in here, but I don't know what other sensors are in here. Um, so if you put them outside, it could re report back to your phone, you know, a history of the uh, temperature. Or if you're putting them all over the Ritz, uh, you would know that it's cold outside and you should go start the fires or whatnot. But, you know, as La I think Laura Norvig in the uh, chat room was talking about the uh, notifications, uh, Event Parrot, uh, you know, that she's afraid about the volume of uh, information that's going to start coming through and choke her... Uh, um, so somebody has a noisy background. I'm yeah, it's sure. Kevin. Uh, we're, we're, we're fixing if it. If you guys can mute when you're not talking, it solves a lot of problems. 
But you know that uh, going back to the beacon thing, it, 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 I've often made this point that the cloud in a mobile era is more like glue, whereas the cloud in the Web2 era was more like where the apps run. And this is a good example of glue because the data is in the cloud. The phone is the link between the device, the, blue, the, 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 the emitter, and the cloud. So the phone knows the emitter number, the cloud knows the context, and the phone is in the middle, and you've basically got uh, three elements to make something uh, work. The device itself doesn't speak to the cloud, the, the Bluetooth emitter, uh, and it doesn't pass any data. So it's a nice way of understanding how by linking a phone to something in the real world in the cloud, you get something that you couldn't really have before. Uh, that, that experience just couldn't exist without all three parts. John Toshik, enterprise implications right. I mean, of this? You've kind of been able to do that with Wi-Fi um, base station IDs for a while, but as you start using um, mobile LTE and things like that, where the, you don't actually have that sense of proximity, um, then this gives you a way of getting that back again. Um, and with that, and the, yeah, the, the the missing the link before was to use GPS, but uh, the, the problem is that only really works outdoors um, and has lots of lots of issues with it. And so there, you know, there, there's been a lot of papering over the cracks inside the operating systems to try and bridge the two. So if you can actually put a physical thing there and say this this is where you are, um, that makes a lot a lot of things much much easier. John, uh, is this going to get anywhere in the enterprise yet? It's only going to be in the enterprise. It's everything we're talking about is enterprise. Yeah. Right. Everyone's connecting into the consumer. It's not. It's not a uh, you know something that's siloed out in a in a uh, in a environment in a game or something like that. This this is a this is truly enterprise, e-commerce, data that goes back into the enterprise for analysis later. I mean, there's not. I mean, it's it's 100% enterprise, and they're yeah. the ones who are going to fund it. Sure. I think that's you know, the you could have said that about Wi-Fi, but actually, there are far more base stations in homes than there are in businesses. Um, That's enterprise too. If you find a concrete use for it, we'll end up doing it, using them in the home as well. Wi-Fi well, is a, a fundamental networking communication technology, and it is an enterprise story um, because it allowed people to connect with the things that they used to, you know, that with their with their customers, and this right. is even more so that way. It's much more. It's much more narrowly focused on a person, and it's going back into the enterprise. The only people who are going to fund this stuff are the enterprise. That's what they want to do. Every example that Robert had mentioned is all enterprise. Yeah, it solves a problem I was trying to solve in another startup, um, which was uh, how do you figure out who's sitting in a conference room together? And we were using ultrasonic sound, uh, uh, and, and it worked, but it was. Um, it had some issues. Uh, this this would solve that. So you could imagine every enterprise conference room just having one of these in. When you sit down, you know, uh, you, your phone knows the time and the room you're in and which documents are intended for that meeting and can put them directly on everyone's laptops, desktop, smartphone, tablet, or whatever. Um, it, it, uh, so that's a basic you know, use case for this, uh, but I think there's lots of others. All right, so uh, John, if you say this is all enterprise and that only enterprise is going to fund it, uh, who's going to fund it first? Who, you know, I mean, is it going to be the uh, hey, Kevin, device? Kevin, man? I'm, I've got him. I'm riding him. I'm, I, yeah, I am. Do you hear it now? Okay, I was riding him. I can't. Yeah, I said the most <laughs> intelligent things of my life just now, and and they couldn't be heard. Sad. The, uh, who's going to fund it? The Internet of Things companies type, you know, that kind of company is going to fund it first. Uh, Cisco will need to do something here. But also, the Google, Apple, Amazon, they're going to want to do this too. And then it's going to go right into the retail stores, the consumer stores like coffee shops, uh, museums. It's going to be, uh, you know. Steve, can you mute Kevin because we can't hear anything. Kevin, can you mute Kevin? No, you're muted. I'm asking you. Just nod, please. Well, I don't think it's me. No, it's not, it's Kevin. I've got him <laughs> all the way down. I'm just trying to find out whether or not I'm he can ride himself. I'm still hearing a street noise. Well, then you're hearing probably uh, Keith. Do you hear it now? 
I still hear it. Do you hear it now? Now, now it's gone. I didn't do it. It sounds like somebody's doing a, you know, one of those, um, you know, a car race in their backyard or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's Kevin. I can just hear an airplane. <laughs> Because a truck going by the coffee shop there. Okay, so I who did, needs who needs these eye beacons? We have Kevin Beacon. <laughs> so Kevin, when you want to say something, just raise your hand, and I'll bring you the level up. Can we continue with what we were talking about, please? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was just saying that it's going to be in all in all the places we're location, um, and that bridge the what used to be near field communication into uh, payments and things like that. That's retail coffee things like that. The, the, the only thing that may block this is the stupidity of companies like Verizon who block a lot of the things around uh, you know, transactions because they develop their own. And uh, it's just insane that that that's happens. Uh, but that's the world we live in right now. What do you mean right now? When has it ever been any different? We're carrying block big Steve, Verizon is is blocking your voice now to try. Steve, and I shut still you can't. Up. I can't hear anybody because of that noise. Can can everybody please mute their microphones? How I, hard is this? I don't. I don't understand what it is that you're hearing. We're not. I'm hearing, hearing that street here. noise in my headset. I hear it too. It's really loud, but it's. Um, I don't think I, it's street noise. All right. It wait a minute. Like I understand. I understand. Hang on. Uh, okay. Kevin is on two. It's really quiet now. Yeah. And I'm still hearing a little bit, but um, maybe the audience isn't hearing it, but I am, and I, it's driving me nuts, and I can't continue Are you because still I can't it? hear anybody. Now it's quiet. It's good. Okay. Oh, so it's either, Kevin, either you mute yourself or we're, you know, we're going to have to pitch you into the uh, bit bucket. I mean, there's a little mute button on Skype. Hit, click mute. I, I don't understand why this is so difficult for all of us to be muted when we're not talking. I have my finger on that button all the time, and I'm muting. Yeah, I, I'm always muting. I <laughs> mute with you. <laughs> I, I'm also I'm, muted. It's that schmuck, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin is now the it's, mime of the Gilmore game. It's nice and quiet now. It's great. I just okay. want to point out. Now that, we can get back to conversation. <laughs> it's good visual, though. I just want to point out that uh, I have never been a moderator, and I never will be one. <laughs> I am just an annoyed person right now. Please continue. You're holding it in very well, though. Yeah. You should see what I'm holding. Should, should we talk about what I, heard, what I learned at uh, Salesforce yesterday? I yes. don't know. <laughs> you I, can. I visited can. the house of Steve Gilmore. <laughs> Sorry, John Toshit. I visited your house. I visited your uh, your headquarters, and I talked with uh, with the senior vice president over there. And I talked with the team putting on uh, Dreamforce. By the way, they're preparing for a hundred and twenty thousand people in San Francisco. Yeah, that's going to be a fun week <laughs> getting around town. Um, well, it's just a different hundred and twenty thousand. And did you know they have? 1250 breakout sessions at this conference I, I you know when i put on conferences at, like with steve gilmore you know doing v bits visual basic insiders i think we had 80 sessions was and that was for 2000 people so i'm i'm glad i don't have to plan this thing <laughs> that's crazy 1250 sessions by the way uh 150 sold out in the first couple of hours uh, they turned on their uh, uh, system just, uh, I think, uh, yesterday morning at midnight or something, and they had uh, 150 sessions sold out within the first hour or two. Um, and what, uh, what are the ones that are popular? Uh, Internet of Things was popular, but um, I, I don't know. I, uh, you know, I, I forget the nut the ones because mm -hmm. so many sold out so quickly that they, you know, how do you? Say which one's the most popular. They actually know which ones are are the most popular, and they're building second rooms for them and all sorts of fun stuff. Did you? What are you doing there, Robert? What uh, what's your uh, your agenda like on? Uh, at well, um, what I really learned, and I don't know if I should say this. Well, you guys won't say it, but I will. Um, context is going to play a huge role at Salesforce and at, at Dreamforce, and um, 
we're uh, starting out Monday afternoon with a speech about uh, me and Shell are giving a speech about our book. So, so what do you mean by you going to give it out? Well, there's in the uh, exhibit hall. There's going to be um, uh, a retail pavilion to show how the um, retail is going to change as people are walking around these low energy Bluetooth radios, right? Um, and there's going to be a lot of stuff that Benioff talks about on at his keynote, which is Tuesday morning, um, about context. And what do you mean by context? Well, uh, he's going to help people get to know their customers better. And how do you get to know your customer better? Know the context of the customer. Where are they? Who are they with? Where did they come from? Um, how many times have you seen them in the past? On and on. It's all the stuff we're talking about in our book. And when is this going to be? What day? Uh, well, uh, when is when I is love Dreamforce? being able to find out all this stuff. Dreamforce is the 18th through the 21st, so that's uh, uh, November. you're talking about the second day? Yeah, so it's uh, Benioff is on stage uh, Tuesday, nineteenth, uh, November 19th. Uh, I hear we're doing a Gilmore Gang at 4 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th. Oh, I'm glad they let you know. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> like I said, I had I had lunch with uh, the team, and they were like, hey, what, when are you open? When are you open? I go, well, put it at 4 p.m. <laughs> Excellent. And obviously, they haven't asked you yet, so we'll see if it gets moved. <laughs> No, no, that's fine. I mean, we uh, we were out. We were out of the office at uh, in Florida. Yeah. So yeah. Anyways, it's it's gonna be a fun time, fun week. And what week is that again? <laughs> November eighteenth. And how do you? The week before Florida? Thanksgiving. Did you have your got your uh, chatter app uh, running yet? No, but the by the way, the app. Uh, that they're building is contextual as well. So as you walk around, it'll recommend app uh, uh, sessions for you that are nearby where you are. So if you're in the Marriott ballroom, it'll say, hey, there's four sessions and you don't have anything on your calendar yet. Uh, so here, take, take those. I, I think what they're doing with the app is really pretty interesting. So. Contextual customer. Where's my cheat sheet? We 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 prepared all this in advance. Just you know, just. Uh, like. we did not, but <laughs> but I had lunch with your coworkers. So. <laughs> no, don't you? When, uh, when I you, probably won't be invited back because when you like, watch Letterman and he says, "So, uh, how's your dog?" and then the guy goes into this four-hour story about his dog. It, you know, there's a, it's all prepared. It's all prepared. Yeah. See, I don't have anything in this here, but this here. I get direction from my uh, producer, and she's telling so, me to. And, and so, Benioff, I hear Tina is is directly hooked into Benioff's ear. So, uh, I hear you know if if Benioff wants something, she, he just calls Tina. That's yeah. right. <laughs> That's true of Benioff everybody. That's how the world works. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say that would work for me if, as well. If you know <laughs> Mr. Benioff, which I know you do, uh, you realize that. Somehow he is able to process all information at all times from all sources. So uh, yeah, uh, everybody yeah. has a direct line into him somehow. It's amazing. I, I, I have the secret. Uh, I have the secret way to Mark, which is um, I met Mark's mum at Ron Conway's uh, end of summer party two weeks ago. Mark's mum is awesome, and uh, she immediately walked across the whole place and dragged Mark over to meet me because she likes me. So Mark's mum is the one to go for if you want to get to Mark. Yeah. So uh, give me a shot of, uh, of Kevin because uh, he is slowly fading away. <laughs> 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 so That's Matthew great. Voschel, this That's is... A TV show. You right? can't yeah. get That's this on Hangouts. Movie. You just can't <laughs> get it. Map. You know, the the National Surrealist Light People's Party is at work again. It's a fire sign reference for those of you who <laughs> couldn't care less. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, that's exciting, Robert. And it's going to be fun to, uh, you know, Dreamforce is, is a state of mind uh, at, at Salesforce. It, uh, the next one starts the day after, or maybe two days after. They give us one day uh, to uh, contemplate. Uh, you know, look and see whether the government's back in session or not. And then we go. So I know we don't talk about politics that much, but I want to hear 
Well, what are your thoughts about the uh, government shutdown? It seems to be going quite well, doesn't it? Uh, well, a lot of people are losing their jobs. No, I don't mean that from a, you know the people that are being hurt by it, but just in terms of the relative... Uh, uh, it's difficult to tell that the government is not working right now. Uh, it, it is if you look in the right place. I mean, you can't go to a national park at the moment. That's true. Well, you can't you go can't to Great go to America the either for some it's reason. shut down because of the government. How do you uh, feel? How do you I was feel supposed to go to a conference tomorrow. That got canceled. Really? What was the conference? Yeah. Uh, it was a conference to government people. <laughs> None of them could, could come, and most of the speakers were government people. None of them could talk. So, yeah, that sort of killed a multi-million dollar conference down in uh, Tampa, Florida. Mm. Um. And we're seeing other other effects, you know. And people are finding out what the government actually does now that it's shut down again. Yeah, well, that's always been the uh, the question: is if, if they shut the government down and nobody notices? To, you know, oh, they're noticing, and and the economy's going to notice. You, you're going to see uh, the economy is definitely noticing. You know, Kevin, what do you think about the government shutdown? Kevin. Well, the, um, there's, a, there's, <laughs> there's that noise the again. <laughs> down so people notice them. That's what the National Parks thing is about, because they actually make more money when they're open than when they're closed. Um, the other thing that I saw was that they've stopped licensing new beers, which is, which is a, a real problem for the people who like craft beer. So that's going to be a, a piling up a problem for, as all the seasonal beers no longer exist. Okay. Thank you. Food checkers are. Uh, I, you know, my point to be on this. Do you want to know what I think? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you if you want. Let me see your passport. Actually, I've got a U.S. passport. I can't show you it right now. But no, that's all right. Go ahead. It reminds me of last week. I went to the Maroon Five concert, and my kids stole Google bikes to oh, get. God. Uh, <laughs> they to, stole. To my kids. They stole Google bikes to ride from where we parked to the concert. And this guy ran down and said, do you work at Google? And I said, absolutely, I've got my door pass. And as I fumbled for it, he says, don't worry, I believe you. And I was completely lying through my teeth. And he's watching now. <laughs> and he's watching now. And, uh, and I couldn't think what else to do. And luckily it worked. Because if he made me show it, I would have had this blank door pass that was not a Google pass. Yeah, I do that with my AAA card, which is a AAA card from 1973. Anyway, government shutdown. Uh, you know, I, I think Americans generally, I exclude everyone on this show and listening um, so they don't attack me afterwards, but I don't think Americans think of the word government as a good word. It, it only has bad connotations because that, and, and it, it, that kind of troubles me because government is equal in my mind to civilization. It's like where we collaborate to create things that we all need. So when the government shuts down, it's kind of like civilization is shutting down. And we all kind of get on the best we can without it. But, um, you know, I, if I was a politician, I'd be worried that what's happening is we, the people, are becoming cynical of you, the government, no matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican and doubting your capacity to provide to us the things that we elect you to do on our collective behalf. And this shutdown, you know, and I'm personally in the cabinet, but if the Republicans caused it and that Obama shouldn't concede, uh, this shutdown just is terrible for both of them. It's terrible for the whole concept of human cooperation to create common good. Well, I think that uh, sort of pivoting from what you said, but uh, taking it into account, I think that what's going on uh, is a, a real opening for uh, the digital economy in general. I think people are going to start to realize that uh, these notification uh, generating uh, devices are far more important to them uh, in their work lives and in their personal lives than any kind of relationship with uh, the so-called government. And I think the government's going to have to catch up very quickly uh, in terms of entering this. Uh, what When you, John Toshek, talk about uh, how this is going to be funded by uh, industry, uh, I wonder whether or not government ha needs to also fund it 
uh, in order to avoid being left behind. Well, there's certainly uh, public works projects that could benefit from this uh, technology. And if the government is in that business of creating some infrastructure, such as highways <laughs> where um, cottage industries develop over, like, you know, sparrows or a cracker barrel or something like that off the highway, you need some kind of infrastructure. And if it becomes pervasive, then it, then it is part of the, the technology infrastructure. And the government has to get involved in some way, at least by outsourcing it to another uh, company. But, of course, that's going to be... That's way down the road now. It's not even, they can't even think of that kind of stuff. Uh, but they will need to at some point. Robert, any thoughts? You're muted. The perfection of silence. It's one of those things when you mute, you better remember to unmute. No, he he's somehow permanently muted. He's not muted, and he can't be heard. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was I was muted. No, you do whatever you just didn't do. You just didn't do it again. He wasn't lying when he said his fingers always on that button. <laughs> All right, now maybe I'm unmuted. There you are. <laughs> it's just sticking in this loop. It's like uh, everything's slow. No, oh. actually, that's the. There he goes again. That's the Skype problem, Steve, that I mentioned. After about an hour, it slows down and it doesn't work anymore. It's probably on the same version as I am. Interesting. Thank you, Microsoft. Yeah. I think Skype's Hi. a 32-bit program. Has anyone checked into that? It's just so dumb. I owned by Microsoft, who's pontificated about 64-bit for at least 10 years. I'm not sure, though. I've seen it register as 32-bit many times, though. Keep your hands. Uh, Microsoft is going to be in a mess for a long time. Um, anyway, that's a, that's last week's show. <laughs> uh, this week's show is about the government. Um, I, I cheer on what uh, Keith said. It's um, you know I, I see government not as an evil, but something that we all need. I I need to drive on roads. I need to be defended by uh, military. I need. Uh, you know, a uh, school system that will make the world a, a better place and uh, ensure that everybody gets an education, not just the rich. And uh, we're just we're destroying that. Uh, you know, we're destroying it with our words, and we're destroying it with our actions, and we're destroying it with our rhetoric. Rhetoric. And there's a a a, a, a people in the in, in, who are taking control who. I love the f the past and uh, don't love the future and um, it pisses me off but there's not much I can do about it other than to watch it all destroy itself and maybe maybe people wake up and get involved well I know Keith has to leave in a few minutes so uh, I want to give him a chance to uh, wrap uh, before he goes but I do want to say that uh, you know the the stuff around what's it called gerrymandering yeah uh, is what's really gotten us into the situation that we're in where yeah. where uh you know a small group has uh you know basically they can do anything they want because they're completely protected by the design but, of the district that they serve and we should explain why that caused uh extremism to happen and probably on both sides right um when you redistrict a uh a, a, a a, a district uh, to make it so that it's an, almost impossible to get s somebody else in, involved. In, in other words, if you, if you build a Republican district here and then a Democratic dis district here, what what the only thing you are w worrying about then is the a primary system and how to get um, the re the Republicans out to vote for your for, for between two Republicans and. How do you get Republicans to go the, to the uh, to the poll and vote in a primary when there's no uh, nobody on the other side, no no uh, Democrat? Well, you 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 uh, pander to the district and you you uh, start getting these extremist points of view, well, which and, don't reflect a national uh, audience. But the right. issues that they are locking up and tying down. Are national issues, and so that that is the fundamental problem exactly. And yeah. w what I think so interesting is is that I think some people are going to. Uh, there's been a lot of strange bedfellows going on in recent days 
uh, as this uh, drags on. You know, somebody in the chat room talks about the Koch brothers, who are notorious conservatives, uh, but they're actually getting really pissed off about uh, the uh, shutdown and are l actively lobbying, among others, who wouldn't normally be, uh, you know, having some leverage, uh, are uh, uh, are lobbying for, uh, you know, some sort of a uh, well, when the when the when the economy fix. goes goes south, the rich people start getting hurt, and um, you know it's fun to play uh, you know political games, but when people start getting laid off and they start changing their buying behavior and they start changing their investment behavior and they start changing their travel behavior, I can't travel to. Tampa tomorrow. So who's getting hurt there? The airline workers getting hurt. The hotel workers getting hurt. The taxi drivers getting hurt. Uh, the city is getting hurt because I'm not bringing dollars into Tampa. They're staying. Well, were there, Tampa what, right were the the real uh, you know what is it? Uh, the track that's the third rail. The real third rail here is the uh, default. If we default, then everybody yeah. gets really slammed. Well, and, and interest rates on houses go up, right? Right, exactly. So people can't get loans. That hurts rich people, Businessmen too. can't get loans, et cetera. So uh, with that, uh, Keith, uh, give us your your parting shots here. Actually, the, the default... Damn, sorry. Uh, the default issue is kind of interesting because uh, the Republicans clearly don't understand economics. They, can't make, they keep making the point that there's enough revenue to pay the interest on the default. Uh, as if you know, uh, as if uh, you could stop paying for everything else and just pay the interest. And they don't understand how the economy, both locally and globally, is interconnected, and how if one little piece of it goes wrong, everything goes wrong. So I, w I worry that we've got a bunch of amateurs making policy decisions about the default, but I have no idea what the consequences would be if that were to happen for the whole chain of value relationships that depend on not defaulting. Okay. Your phone's going nuts, man. It, it's your congressman. Uh, it is. It's okay. probably calling me. It's probably the NSA saying, we heard what you said, now shut up. <laughs> they couldn't hear what you're saying because they're, right, okay. they're shut down. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I wonder. I'll, 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 uh, I will leave you so I can answer it. Okay. Thanks. See you next Bye. time. And gone. <laughs> I'm getting like scope. I'm just, <laughs> it's still all ringing. I want to hear is nothing. <laughs> well, that's an interesting opinion. Can you <sighs> say it without talking? <laughs> all hey, right. What else? We got to run soon. Uh, no, I think that that's a good wrap. <laughs> um, we didn't talk about all the stuff we learned about Twitter and uh, Nick Bilton's uh, book reveal, uh, or learned about it. Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos from uh, uh, the book. Uh, who wrote the Jeff Bezos book? Uh, I'm not sure, but it, uh, Kevin, you needed to say something? Well, the other point about the government thing is that um, because they shut down the websites, they all shut down the open data APIs and the web websites that are providing that, and that's impacted a lot of uh, startups who were relying on that data, and suddenly instead of getting um, the data or even a sensible error page, they're getting web pages and a whole bunch of services fall over. So a lot of the um, local travel services and things like that suddenly stop working because the, the government um, pulled the plug on the websites um, as part of the shutdown. So that was that was you know, an example of um, where government would be making good progress on providing useful services that other people could build on top of, and suddenly that stuff was pulled out from under them. And that's getting a lot of people to rethink um, relying on that and starting to think about caching it themselves and so on. John? I think we wrapped up on the government. I mean, I would try to get your house refinanced now for everyone out there who has to do it. Um, the, uh, I think uh, 800,000 people out of work with the promise that they're going to get some back pay is one thing. And I think that, uh, that there's a whole bunch of people who are it's not clear whether their benefits are going to kick in and they're, and they're going to be hurt the worst. And that's pretty bad also. Uh, and that impacts the default and everything going on. Um, but I think people have this um, kind of insane amount of optimism about the government that it's just going to be resolved. You know, if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. If it's not tomorrow, it'll be the next day. And they just keep on going on this 
blindly because it doesn't seem like it's going to get resolved at all. Yeah. And that's what's really worrying to me. Yeah, well, well, the polls the polls are are shifting things, um, but yeah, these both sides the poll, are hard. The, the I mean, polls say they hate, everyone hates the government, but they're not. They don't. They think that it's going to come through. I mean, that's yeah, but it, they that's hate the, they hate certain parts of the government more than others, and that is bringing the uh, the various people to the table. I, I find it fascinating so far that you know the Republicans have always had uh, in the last say three national elections they've always had a real uh, lock on using technology for their benefit, and with uh, the last election, um, Obama basically cleaned their clock, technologically speaking. Uh, so I think that th that we're going to see a rebound by the moderate wing of the Republican Party. That uh, you know, I mean, they've got this direct line to people through their apps, and I think that when they start paying attention to that, that things are going to. Uh, you know, be more. You know, the whole question of where the power sits in Congress isn't going to change in terms of the House's lock on things. But uh, you know, the, the senators are are basically in a situation where they have to figure out what to do. There was an interesting article in the Times about how businesses who have been traditionally supporting Republicans and you know something like ninety percent of their uh, contributions. Uh, are uh, very, very worried about the influence uh, uh, that the Tea Party has uh, relative to their contributions, and they're starting to, to do something about this. And that's where the Koch brothers and others are, are lining up. And that, that's an interesting coalition that might have a, a salutary effect. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. Yes, Kevin, go ahead. You, you've got your the kill switch, and you can just turn that around, and it's the open <laughs> switch. Well, the the the, the challenge of um, there there are huge structural challenges in U.S. politics because of the both the gerrymandering thing and the two party system, but also the fact that so much money is required to um, fight an election, um, and the, the the real question is. Could a potential third-party movement um, take advantage of the net to build something grassroots that challenges this system and, and, and fight one of these next elections? And that's been you know, sort of threatened for a while. Um, people have been talking about this, and we've seen things like this happen in, in, in Europe with the Pirate Party and things like that. And the question is, is, is America right for that? Is, something, is, is that something that could actually happen here? I don't... I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, the, the, first of all, the, I always look at the world through distribution. Can you get, get distribution? And, and politics is distribution of ideas, right? Can I get uh, a poor person in Missouri to hear about my idea to, and, and convert and, and get them excited by it? And the internet, yeah, is reaching a lot of people, but it's not reaching all the people. And I, I've walked I've walked around with politicians, you know, in, in North Carolina and other places, and talked with lots of them all over the place. And it, it comes down to retail distribution. Can you get the boots on the street to go visit the houses to convince people to vote, and and, and hear about your idea or your candidate or your uh, your point of view? And that is expensive. I mean, I, I was on John Edwards' plane when he announced he was running for president. And just that one trip cost, in fuel alone, forty-five thousand dollars, and um, and and people change their votes when you come and visit them. They also change your, their votes when you're cheating on them too. <laughs> and he learned that the hard way. But um, you know, if you can't fund, uh, if you can't get the money to fund a real campaign by a third party. Um, you're not going to see a third party really get serious. I mean, you, yes, you can get 15%, 20%, maybe even 30%, but you can't win. And you can't win as a systemic thing, uh, uh, you know, like, like the Republicans or Democrats can. And it's, um, I just don't see a third party coming up in America that, that's going to be um, credible. Um, uh, I agree. Uh, uh, John Toshek, uh, final thoughts. Um, yeah, we beat that horse, but there's still more horses to beat there. Um, yeah, there's no third-party system. 
that's going to be relevant because uh, there's too much money behind it. But if you if there were some rules and regulations or laws or you know that limited campaign financing, there could be a rise of another system. But of course, that won't pass anything because people like to be tied into the party. It's a uh, vicious uh, cycle that won't uh, or catch twenty two that won't be solved. Um, as far as technology spending, innovation, things like that that are happening, even despite the government uh, uh, shutdown for now, I think there's going to be a big race to uh, that will see a lot of interesting things coming out because of it, uh, because people want to capitalize on it, you know, in case it does come back and they want to be ready for it, and that's always true. But it could create some kind of you know warp in the uh, technologies that do come out and, and the purposes that are useful and, and uh, that have adoption by people, too. Well, I'm going to wrap this one. I, I want to just comment on one thing that I was expecting earlier, and I only saw one person, Darren, uh, dropping off because there's, quote, too much political chat. Uh, I think that that uh, really defines uh, the ludicrous nature of uh, uh, people who decide that, that the politics of our country is too boring. That's why we get what we're getting right now is because people just don't care and they don't pay attention. Uh, and what is it that you expect to actually happen uh, if you live in that kind of a, a of a, a place? People should care. You should pay attention. You should realize that you have incredible power. Uh, that you know where your clicks and thoughts and information goes is where your power lies. And we have a lot of power, and we're just not using it correctly. It doesn't mean that we don't. Uh, have a choice here. It doesn't mean that John Tushek is wrong, that the things are aligned against, uh, you know, things getting better. Uh, but things do get better, and uh, we have incredible opportunities. So, uh, you know, this guy says that he's going to catch us all next week. Why? I'll, we'll talk the whole time next about about this. Don't, don't. <laughs> Don't push me, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I I hate that too. I and I also I, today I had somebody said I'm unfollowing you. It's like really I I enjoy listening to people I don't agree with because it helps inform my own opinion and um and sometimes they're right. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it takes skill to recognize when they're right too. But sometimes they are, you know, and that's. If if you can't change your mind, you're not intelligent. You're a robot. You know, it's like ah, drives me nuts. And I'll do, I'll give you one uh, final. I mean, I don't. I try not to talk too much about uh, uh, Salesforce and and particular Mark Benioff, uh, who I consider to be. I mean, I wouldn't be at Salesforce if it wasn't for the guy who's on the show here, uh, Mr. Tashek, who's an old friend and. Uh, made it possible for me to c come to the company. But, uh, you know, I've known Mark a long time, and here's somebody who puts his money where his uh, uh, spirit and his, uh, he just contributed some incredible amount of money, two points, what is it, 2.7 million? Uh, That's right, yep. To the city. To the middle schools. Of San Francisco. And this yeah. is, you know... Now he, you, you know, I, in fact, I asked one of the uh, Dreamforce uh, guys, you know, why don't you move this thing to Vegas? Because 120,000 people in town is it's a little bit hard for everybody to deal with, including them. And uh, he's he and his answer was very quick. Mark would never allow that, never. And and Mark is a uh, Mark is one of those guys that understands the impact of a company on a neighborhood and on a on a city and on a people, and it's far better you know voting with your dollars and your attention is how you change the world well that says it just perfectly uh i want to thank uh, rackspace and particularly rob Lejess, without which this we wouldn't have the opportunity to sound off uh endlessly about uh politics or anything else we feel like talking about i want to yeah he's my boss again by the way is that right yeah oh well yeah he's a smart guy and uh, so are you. I want to thank uh, uh, New Tech. Thank you. Keep up the good work. I want to thank uh, our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. There you go. I want to thank uh, John Toshek. <laughs> I want to thank... Hey, don't copy me.
copy me? I didn't have anything original, and everything goes through you anyway. <laughs> Take that, Google+. Plus. I want to thank uh, Robert Scoble. What's up? Uh, maybe uh, we're going to be in uh, somewhere, maybe New York next week. I don't know where we're going to be. But uh, if we are and we're not in the studio, maybe we'll try a Google Plus uh, a Hangout session and see yeah. see how it feels. I, I'm going to have office hours at Rackspace uh, San Francisco on Monday because I can't go to this conference. <laughs> so I said, hey, let's open the doors, let everybody in, let's have a fun party. And I'll be there uh, 11 to 3. Well, that's, uh, that sounds fun. Yeah. And, and uh, Kevin Marks, thank you very much. We now return control of our TV set to you once more. Uh, thanks to the chat room. Thanks to everybody who showed up. See you again next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>